Do you need some help teaching your dog where you want him to pee or poop and when? If so, I hope you'll check out our brand new totally free house training guide. You can find it at schoolforthedogs.com slash house. It's filled with lots of really good tips on how to train a dog to potty in the right spot, but it also is going to explain to you how to teach your dog to do it on cue. So go check it out. Schoolforthedogs.com slash house. And now for something completely different. Hi, my name is Annie Grossman and I'm a dog trainer. This podcast is brought to you by School for the Dogs, a Manhattan-based facility I own and operate along with some of the city's finest dog trainers. During this podcast, we'll be answering your questions, geeking out on animal behavior, discussing pet trends, and interviewing industry experts. Welcome to School for the Dogs podcast. Hi, thanks for being here, humans. There are two parts to this episode. One part is about retractable leashes, and the other part is a conversation I had with Alex Waite, who is one of the founders of Shameless, which is a really cool brand of treats that you're going to learn a lot about. They're doing things differently in a very interesting way. Just a reminder that if you like this podcast, please go to iTunes and leave a review and support us by shopping in our online store, storeforthedogs.com. I think we have the greatest stuff in the world there uh, for people who love their dogs. Enjoy! So here's something you might not know if you've never worked with a dog trainer or you don't hang out with dog trainers. Most dog trainers, at least the ones I know, don't like retractable leashes. And there are there are a bunch of reasons for this. For one, we want our dogs to ideally be walking on a loose leash. I always say, you know, a, a leash should be there the same way a seatbelt is in a car, you know, you don't wear the seatbelt and then feel like, okay, now I can drive like a madman. It's there in case of an emergency. Ideally, your dog should be able to walk in a vicinity that is acceptable, but the leash should be there in case of an emergency. And if you have a leash that is always taut, your dog can get used to feeling that the leash has to have some kind of pull on him at all times. So often dogs on retractable leashes are dogs who have learned to pull. Uh, Another reason is that the cord uh, that attaches the clasp to the plastic chunky part of the retractable leash is very thin and if you if you get it around wound around a finger or your leg or a dog, it can really do some damage. Actually, if you go to Google and you start typing in retractable leash, uh, at least on my computer, the first suggested thing that comes up for you to be Googling is retractable leash injuries. Thanks to the magic of Google images, you can see what retractable leash injuries look like and they're pretty awful. Um, Another reason that they can be dangerous is because they, you know, if, I I assume if you're listening, you know what a retractable leash is, what it looks like, but to uh, those who might not, it's like this big chunky plastic thing attached to, uh, what with, that has like a, (laughs) I'm not doing a very good job. It's a big clunky plastic thing that has like a, a, a spindled, is that a word? Spindled cord inside of it that is retractable with a clasp on the end. And if you picture that um, 
the clasp is attached to your dog and you let go of the leash, uh, it's going to hurdle to your dog, I guess, unless you have a small dog in which I guess the dog could hurdle towards the plastic handle. I'm not sure of the physics of it, but also not a good thing. And they, uh, that can be really terrifying to a dog and potentially, of course, just really super dangerous. So these are just some of the reasons why dog trainers don't typically like retractable leashes. Oh, you know, another thing that I don't like about it is like it takes up your whole hand and so you can't really do very much with your hand. I like the opposite. Like I like having a hands-free leash, a waist leash, something that leaves my hands open uh, because then I can move my dog around with a hand touch. I can use treats. It's just really freeing to not have to use your hands when you're walking your dog all the time and the retractable leash is going to completely occupy one hand. Anyway, I have to admit, however, that I recently bought a retractable leash to use with my dog for a very specific reason and I just wanted to share this as uh, I think I can offer a little bit of a hack in case you are going to use a retractable leash for this reason. I bought it so that I could walk my dog while pushing uh, my toddler in her stroller because I found that when I used just sort of his regular long leash we have a, a found my animal leash which is long enough for me to wear around my waist I found if I wore it around my waist or if I had it in my hand while I was pushing the stroller it was just a lot more likely to get caught up in the wheel of the stroller and it just felt a little bit hard to manage outside on the busy streets of New York but I thought about it and thought you know if he was on a leash that were always taut, then it would never be dragging on the ground. So I uh, got a very small retractable leash to try with him. I like small leashes, so I think, you know, the smaller, the better. But here's my simple little hack. I attached another leash around the cord part and held the end of that leash at the same time. So it's taut when he is walking and I'm not too worried about him, you know, learning to pull because of this because he has a lot of years of not walking this way under his belt. I think he's got it down. Um, But the leash that is looped basically to the thin cord and then attached um, just at my wrist is gonna keep the big plastic handle part from ever snapping and going towards him if I were to let go of it or if anyone were to let go of it. Um, I actually do let Magnolia, my daughter, walk Amos sometimes. It's like her favorite thing in the world. She would like to walk every dog on the street. What's crazy is like, (laughs) she's so interested in in dogs and people's leashes and people will actually hand her their leashes and be like, do you want to walk my dog? And I'm like, are you crazy? (laughs) She's not even two. No, (laughs) do not let her walk your dog. I do, however, let her walk our little uh, 18-pound dog, Amos. But I do it in this way where I let her hold the big clunky retractable leash handle. Well, relatively small because I got the small one. But I'm holding the leash that is attached to it. So if she lets go, it's going to catch on the leash that I'm holding way before it goes towards Amos. Anyway, it's worked out pretty well. She's thrilled to get to hold the leash. He's happy that he has some room to move around where he's not forced to be near the stroller where there's a chance of the leash or paws getting under the wheels and uh, so yeah that's my tip on using a retractable leash use a second leash so i was thinking about this the other day and thinking you know i should mention on the podcast that this is a way to use a retractable leash uh in a safer way And uh, lo and behold, like an hour later, 
I got an email from a podcast listener in Austin. Her name is Lalanya. She has a company called Dog People Embark. She said, I saw this hilarious clip uh, from this comedian uh, named Drew Lynch. He stutters because of a softball accident he had. Anyway, it's all about retractable leashes, and I thought you'd like it. So this is the comedian Drew Lynch on retractable leashes. I walk my dog on on, on, on a on a regular leash, not not not, not a retractable leash. If you don't, yeah. If, if you if you don't know what a retractable leash is, it is it is it is basically a tape measure. <laughs> that you attach to your dog to measure how shitty of an owner you are, so. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, don't worry. If your dog wanders too far, there is a button you can press to to choke it, so. You know, me and my dog, we, we, we have a safe word, but you do whatever. You ever seen a dog walk on one, 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 one of those things? It has no idea it, it's on a leash. It's always a 300-foot radius ahead of the owner, tripping innocent civilians as, 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 as it crushes its windpipe in the process. Every, every, every little dog I see on a retractable leash is always... <laughs> That's probably how pugs were invented, to be honest. That's, that's what happened. A French bulldog went, went, went for a retractable leash walk. A little lost air and his eyes popped from his sockets. Pug. Sometimes I'll see dogs that are smaller than the, the, the leash itself. And that is physics I, I cannot get behind. <laughs> Like there was this one time I was back home and then in Los Angeles, I was walking my dog on, on, on a regular leash and, and, and on a retractable leash, I saw this chihuahua that was walking its lady. <laughs> and the chihuahua charged at m- m- my dog, okay? And from a kilometer away, <laughs> I say kilometer because this, 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 this was in Canada. She... <laughs> the lady pressed the button, and I am not exaggerating. The chihuahua went. <laughs> I could have saved him. But the portal was closed. It was too late. That dog belongs to the past now. I'd never seen a Chihuahua zipline before. That was, that was, that was adorable. No, no, no helmet. I hope he signed the terms and conditions. I thought that was the end of the exchange and then and, and, and until the lady and I crossed paths about, about, about an hour later. <laughs> She, she, she had to get through customs and she was apologizing profusely. She was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My chihuahua is just a bit overly friendly. I was like, yeah, you're, you're, you're yo-yo's a bit aggressive. And she was like, she was like, well, I don't under, under, understand the problem here. I was like, here's, here's the problem here is, thank God my dog is not also aggressive because she is much bigger than, than, than your dog. And if when your dog charged, my dog had charged, it would have just ate. <laughs> yes, <Your> chihuahua. <laughs> you would have then pressed the button and just caught m- my dog. You can't be fishing for, for bigger breeds out here. It's, it, it's illegal, I think. The lady's like, well, I like my dog to have freedom for, 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 for when we go on walks. And I was like, yeah, but in the city, it's, it's a bit too much freedom, wouldn't you say? Here's an example. We're, we're talking. Your dog is a, across the street right now. 
about to clothesline an, an, an SUV. It's <laughs> Red Rover send the, the Range Rover over? It's, it's, it's not gonna go good. And the lady's like, well, since you so adamantly disagree with the, with, with, with the invention, why don't you take it up with the, with the inventor, who's, who's, who's still alive, by the way. Her name's Mary Delaney, in, in case you wanted to know. <laughs> I was like, I did not. <laughs> but I could see how that makes sense. I think a woman could invent something with the illusion of, go, be, be free, psych! <laughs> Edgy. <laughs> we did that, that, did that joke one time, and the guy came, came up to me after a show, <laughs> visibly upset. He was like, I didn't quite appreciate that, that, that retractable leash bit. You're in Cleveland, bitch! I, I, I walk my dog on, on, on a retractable leash. I was like, I know, you're holding one. <laughs> I met your dog ten minutes ago. They're <laughs> <laughs> probably home by now. So. <laughs> and the guy was like, it just didn't make for, for, for a very good end to, to the night. And I was like, look, man, everything I say up here is, 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 is lighthearted. It's meant to be taken in jest and not too seriously. But if I did say something that, then, that had sincerely upset you, then I would like to apologize. I'm sorry, and, and, and I take it back. And the guy was like, well, the damage is already done now. <laughs> you can't just take it back. And I was like, sure I can. It's, it's retractable. <laughs> okay, thank you. I actually looked up Mary Delaney's patent for the original retractable leash. It's pretty cool. I will link to it in the show notes. It looks nothing like any retractable leash I've ever seen before. And uh, I'm pretty sure Mary Delaney is not actually still alive as the patent was filed in 1908. I've told you about a product I don't like and about its inventor. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you about a product I do like and I'm going to share with you a, a conversation with one of its inventors, Alex Waite. I started my conversation with her sharing a story from my childhood about someone else who had a similar idea. So growing up, um, I had this neighbor who was kind of eccentric and like kind of like a Kramer character from, you know, Seinfeld. And uh, he would have kind of crazy ideas sometimes. And he got very serious at one point, maybe this like in the 90s, with this crazy idea that he was going to go to all the finest restaurants in New York City and collect all of their uh, scrap food and turn it into very high-end dog food. <laughs> Not so outrageous these days, right? <laughs> well, right, but it was so it, it like it was such a hilarious idea and such a bad idea, but like such a perfect combo of like hilarious and bad. <laughs> because you know, of course, like you can't like what about you know think about all the like cream sauces and like th you know it wouldn't yeah. be like a balanced diet. But of course, now it's like you know, well, dogs did probably evolve to eat our waste. Um, but anyway, um, I kind of forgot about that until I was shopping uh, where we buy our treats from on one of these um, wholesale sites. And uh, a few, this was a few weeks ago. And I saw um, just something about, you know, these treats are upcycled. And I thought, what does that mean? I have to learn more. So I, I started reading a little bit about what you're doing. And I, it reminded me of this story of my neighbor. 
<laughs> but it was like, oh, wait, somebody actually maybe figured out how to do this right. <laughs> so tell me where, where the, what the idea is and, and what the origins of the idea are. Yeah, so um, that's an awesome story. I think uh, we definitely uh, source unused food, but from a pre-consumer uh, place so that we can create like a food safe environment for the material that goes into our products. But um, we started Shameless Pets about three years ago where um, my background is actually in food product development. I was developing human food um, in the organic natural food industry for uh, I think eight years before starting Shameless Pets. And so um, like what kinds of what kinds of foods? Yeah, so I was a director of R&D for Mary's Gone Crackers. They make Oh, or- I love those. They're yeah. delish. They uh, make organic and allergen-friendly snack food items. So um, I started fresh out of grad school with Mary. Um, she was working in the kitchen and just didn't want to do it any longer. So I was able to step into her shoes and learn through um, how she creates food products, which is usually, uh, it's, it's always using whole foods, whole ingredients. Um, and really clean labeled food. So it was fun to learn hands-on in that process and then um, take my knowledge and, and start applying it to our, our pet products here. What did, what did, you said you had gotten a master's. What did you gotten a master's in to lead up to that? Yeah, I got a master's in nutrition education. My background is uh, nutrition, food science, and uh, strangely enough, exercise physiology. So um took my science nerdy background and applied it to to food. So then what got you guys thinking about making a pet food? Yeah, so or a pet treat, I should say. Yeah, I was living in Boston at the time um, where I met my co-founder, James, and he comes from like a retail background. So he was a, a senior buyer at Target um, and he worked in their food innovation lab and he was working on concepts on circular agriculture. And meanwhile, I had always really admired um, the upcycle movement. So upcycling started a few years ago in the CPG space where, where companies were working on solutions for the, the massive food waste problem that we have. Um, and so him and I came together and, and just had a shared passion for creating a mission-based organization. And I'm a proud dog mom myself. So um, just my dogs are just like a big inspiration for me and the creation of these foods um, and creating something that is a clean, clean labeled um, ingredient, uh, whole food based product for, for our pets. Circular. What did you call it? Circular for agriculture? agriculture. Yeah. So what it's, does that mean? Yeah. It's looking at all aspects of the, the supply chain and learning about um, how to create efficiencies to prevent waste. Um, so one thing kind of leads into another, leads into another, leads into another to complete like a closed loop system where um, no waste or little waste exists. So is that a goal for any any kind of any kind of food? Um, like it, what would be an example? <laughs> yeah. So um, I think that for him at the time he was looking at like for instance, in retail, um, where on the sh- store shelves, they, they waste a lot of food product, which it's one of the locations where food, food waste occurs. Um, yeah. I always think like, they're, like the food yeah. stand at this place near my house, they have like, you know, 80 lemons on view. And yeah. not like, it's not like they sell 80. Exactly. All of those. It's not like at the end of the day, there's only one lemon left. You know? Yeah, no, exactly. And that's just one of the areas. So looking at um, why does waste occur in this space? Why is it that we need to have 80 lemons on display rather than only what we need to sell? Um, and and if it were such that waste is going to occur, what is it that we can do with that waste to prevent it from being a total uh, <laughs> or that extra from being a total waste? How are how are how is Shameless part of creating a closed loop? Yeah, so we actually work with, um, so if you look at where food waste occurs, uh, it occurs in lots of places of the supply chain, starting at the farm level and going all the way to the consumer level, where at the farm, something might get wasted because it doesn't quite look the right way. So if you look at the the retail store shelves, you'll see that all the sweet potatoes are really pretty good looking, or they don't have, they're not the the giant sweet potatoes that they can grow to if they're not picked at the right time, or um, maybe it's an apple that has a blemish on it. 
Um, these are the reasons why food and, agri and agriculture gets wasted. Another reason could be for up overproduction um, due to like, for instance, in this COVID circumstance where food was funneling to the food service industries where, um, you know, lots of food goes to school cafeterias or to sporting events. Now that food doesn't have a home. So it's being over, it was overproduced for the need that that was um, at the time. And then food also gets wasted in um, transportation. So taking food from one location to another, it also gets wasted at the processing level. So for example, maybe a, um, like for, I use this example because it, it's relevant to us, but the zucchini noodles or the butternut squash noodles that you see on the grocery store shelves, like they get spiralized and they get put into this package onto the, to the store shelves. Well, that doesn't get grown that way. So what happens to the rest of that, that butternut squash that didn't necessarily get to be the right length of spiral, or maybe it's just the, the cut of that, that doesn't, doesn't meet the like the noodle specification um the imperfect noodle the imperfect noodle exactly it so make the cut yeah and then that's exactly it um so that's one reason in a processing level or maybe mm -hmm. like a cut of of a meat or cut of cheese that didn't necessarily get to the right specification like it's maybe it's a little too fatty or maybe it's not the right color there's reasons why food gets wasted at the processing level um, and then I already talked about the retail level, which is the grocery store shelves. And then the consumer at home is another level where consumers don't necessarily, they either buy too much food, they don't meal prep properly, they leave a little bit on their plate because they're on a diet or something that nature, they don't eat their leftovers. Those are reasons why food at home and even expiration dates on food, like um, not really understanding when the best buy date could be. Um, that's a reason why food would get lost at home. So. Us at Shameless Pets, um, we started to look at the reasons in the beginning of the supply chain. Um, so, for example, at the agriculture level, like the imperfect produce, um, or the processing level, like the <clears throat> the butternut squash noodles that I mentioned that have lots of little um, pieces that aren't the right size or shape. We started looking at those aspects and wondering how we could incorporate those into a product that could be nutritious and um actually enjoyed by our pets. And so that's what we've done is working at the pre-consumer level to create these finished goods, which are the, the dog treats that we sell. So interesting. And now th there's some pretty wild flavors that you've come up with where <laughs> were the flavors led by what's available uh, or the other way around? Um, I, did you have the flavors in mind? Uh, <laughs> well, 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 why don't you yeah, talk about a couple, a couple of the flavors? We we only just got them in, so gotcha. I haven't had the chance to taste test them yet with very many dogs, but I, I picked them by their names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do. Uh, we had a good time naming them. But uh, yeah, I like to create food that sounds appealing, I would say, to us as humans. You know, as a pet company, we're selling dog treats. So we want to make sure that they're nutritious and they're, they're good for the dog first and foremost. And all the ingredients are ingredients that um, would provide some nutritional benefit for the pet. Um, but also as humans, we are the ones that are buying the, the treats. And so uh, we want to make these treats appeal to the human senses as well. So when I make a flavor, I'm thinking, hmm, what sounds good to me? Like what's something that I could envision myself eating that's really like nostalgic, like our peanut butter, bacon, banana, um, like the Elvis uh, treat that we made, or is it just like a like a blueberry mint, which for me like is reminiscent of a mojito or something, something that <laughs> like it would be what I would enjoy to eat myself. And also, you know, like I said, provides the the health and nutrition that, that pets also need. You're answering the question by saying you came up with the flavors first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And sometimes, you know, it, it's we could be inspired by like a, a an ingredient that comes our way. Like I can say that um, I'm working on a jerky recipe right now that incorporates salmon skins. And that was an opportunity that came about through a conversation with a retailer who was having uh, an issue with their waste and, and didn't have a home for salmon skins. And salmon skins are actually really healthy and beneficial for pets. Um, they provide a lot of omegas um, for their skin and coat health. So we worked with that retailer as an example to 
incorporate that salmon skin into a new jerky flavor that we're that we're working on right now. That's really cool. Um, and you have lobster treats, which I've never seen before. Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, that was actually one of our first flavors that we launched. Um, being in New England at the time, I was definitely inspired by by the region. Well, so how does what is the lobster waste? Is it the the shells ground up? Is it the yeah, it what people don't eat when they because they can't pick it out with that tiny little fork? <laughs> it's both. It's actually the the everything basically but the claws and the the body of the lobster. So it's um, still the protein and the the organ meat. Even actually, it provides um, healthy fats as well. But yeah, it does incorporate the shell, which is actually a natural source of glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, and so it's it acts like a shrimp shell. Sometimes people put shrimp shells in their dogs' meals as well. Mm. Um, but it's ground up, so it's super super fine. And there's like no, it acts like a flour in the recipe. So there's not any like choking hazards or anything like that when you if you were to throw like a shell at a dog. But um, Everything's super finely ground, so it's um, it's easy to eat. <laughs> so I'm just curious. You decided you want to start a like dog treat company, mm -hmm. and where are you guys based? We're in Chicago. Like, what is the first step? Like, I want to have a dog treat company. Like, do you? Yeah. Do you, you do, do you need funding? Do you need recipes? Do you like? I, I'm curious. Yeah. So I started res with recipes in my kitchen, just being a product developer and having that experience. I I know how to make. A product from scratch so from taking like an idea and then figuring out what is it that i need to do in order to make this scalable which is uh made in a factory for like a the full scale recipes um but that's that's definitely first first step is having these recipes that um we put together uh we obviously had to create a brand and it was something that we worked on as a team with other um we have another uh, founder, his name is Mike, Mike Lucas, he came in and, and helped us specifically on the branding work and how we thought about um, the flavor names and the colors and uh, even our logo and what that meant and the claims and things like that. How did you come up with the name Shameless? Um, have you ever heard of pet shaming? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I, I was always, I, I thought it was hilarious. I loved seeing these funny these these dogs that are just getting into trouble and um, doing things unbeknownst to them that they were being these little buggers and like I just love that about pets and how they they are in fact shameless in their behavior and who they are and I think it's something that um, I personally even aspire to and and find a lot of joy out of as well so and what was your inspiration then for the the packaging or how would you describe the packaging to someone who hasn't seen it. Uh, yeah. So the packaging is, uh, it's, a. Uh, or I should say, how would you describe the rest of the brand, I guess, to someone who's. Sure. Yeah. Sure. The brand is, I would say it's, um, colorful. We use a lot of vibrant colors, um, and paired with white. So it's, uh, that white base with, uh, with that pop of color. <clears throat> Each flavor has its own color scheme with, uh, that vibrant color. Um, we, we actually re recently rebranded our logo. So I think we took the, right now it's like, a, it's a, technically the upcycled symbol symbol um, with the dog kind of popping out of it sheepishly having like this, this mischievous look on its face. Um, we transitioned from that triangle kind of upcycled to more of a U. So it's just a little bit, I would say more modern looking, um, which is something we did very, very recently. Um, all of our original products were biscuits, they're soft baked biscuits. Um, and so we recently transitioned our packaging to be more I, we realized that we didn't put on the front of pack, like, what is this? <laughs> right. Like it, it didn't say bis like soft baked biscuits very clearly. It said it on the bottom, but we, we put it more clearly on the front of pack as well. Cause now we have jerky and we have dental sticks and other product lines. Um, all of our products are grain free, all natural. We have no artificial flavors or colors. You can read the ingredients really easily or not like, Oh, what's that? Um, we do uh, in our journey. I really, I'm looking at it as we're talking. I really like your packaging. I love the little, like, the little cartoons that you have. And the logo yeah. is super cute, hand-drawn dog. Um, yeah, we did I, I, icons on the front of packs so you can see, like, what are the couple of different ingredients that are really distinct to that flavor. 
like my dog likes sweet potato or, hey, this lobster, it's different. It's unique. I haven't seen it. Let's try it kind of thing. I, I've never I've also I've never seen lobster treats. They're called lobster roll over flavor. Um, but I've also never seen egg treats. Tell me about the break and egg flavor. Yeah, I wanted to make it was one of our original flavors. I wanted to make an alternative protein type product that eggs are actually a really great source of protein for our pets and for us as humans. I personally eat eggs every day. I love them. Um, so I, I just decided that I wanted to make alternative protein um, type products for our pets if someone wanted that option. And so what has the response been from from both dogs and humans? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So dogs love our treats. I mean, I, I, I would say that it is very, very rare when we have the feedback that their dog doesn't like a, a treat. Um, it does happen very, very rarely, but if it does, we always offer another flavor or give them a refund. We always guarantee our products. But um, so far dogs have been really excited about pretty much any flavor. I would say lobster rollover is, is a, is the showstopper. People haven't seen it before, or they like that it has glucosamine and chondroitin in it for like older dogs. Um, so far, the texture is a really big hit. They're nice and soft, but they also don't crumble. So they can be broken into small pieces for training, or you can put them in your pocket when you go on a walk, things like that. Um, I would say retailers or at least stores are really excited about the concept and really like the upcycled movement. They also are starting to want to be a part of it. So having those conversations like that salmon skin, as an example, seems to be happening more frequently where, where retailers really want to be a part of that, that upcycling change. Um, but yeah, so far so good. I mean, we've launched in, in the past two and a half years since having product, um, even shorter than that, I would say two years that we've had like a finished product to have on shelves. Um, we're in about 2,500 stores nationwide and we're launching with, um, with even Costco regions this, this month. So we're, we're going for fairly quickly and, and it seems like people are resonating with the sustainable mission of our, our products. Well, that's very cool. And we, we now have them at our shop in the East village in Manhattan Oh, cool! and, and also at our online store, storefortheDogs.com. And, um, are there other companies in the dog treat world or dog food world that you feel like are, um, also doing cool things? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, open farm, I think has really amazing sustain, like sustainability focused type, um, food and products. I've, I've always been a fan of what they're doing. Um, I think I, I gravitate. Yeah. What? I don't know them. What do they make? Um, they make a whole line of, um, food and they make treats, I believe as well. Um, they have, uh, yeah, they basically like a whole line of, of product. I believe they're a Canadian based brand, but they, um, they have really admirable, high quality, high quality standards. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that that's great. I think, um, that, that there's interesting companies doing, um, even, um, Bond Pet Foods, for example, they're making, um, they are basically creating a chicken that is grown rather than a real chicken. Um, so they're starting to do experimentation on, um, basically lab grown meat to take the place of actual chicken farms and, and beef farms and, and things like that. So it's, it's definitely cutting edge and um, something worth looking at. I know people probably have a, a wide range of, of opinions about that, but I think that it's something that in terms of sustainability is really an interesting um, avenue to consider for, for pet products. And probably will happen with dogs before it happens for us, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, I believe so. I think I will, I'll say in the next few years, I'm sure that they'll have wow. a finished product to check out. I like, I like the alternative. I like the, the sustainable focused brands. I think that that's, um, that's always, I think that's the wave of the future and where products need to head in order to, um, just keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking. I think this is so interesting. You know, also it's part of what's interesting about it is like, you know, like I said, when we started talking, you know, we're, we think dogs very likely evolve to eat our waste. Yeah. And uh, 
so it's sort of like an interesting modern take on how to do that in a like thoughtful, responsible way. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for, for that feedback. And I think we can work together, both our pets and us to uh, create a more sustainable future. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, and it, but what's so kind of interesting about it, it's like, do you, do you know the theory about dog evolution that has to do with them eating like waste? Yeah. So weren't they like at first initially, uh, I mean, they evolved from wolves and they didn't. Right. Well, the, their, their theory and it's talked about, um, uh, the book Dogs by uh, Ray and Lorna Compinger has a great chapter on it. Uh, and, you know, I think it's a theory that maybe has been criticized, but basically it makes sense to me when the idea is <laughs> that, like, you know, it was the wolf, it, dogs started to um, uh, evolve from wolves because around the time when we started um, having settlements and not being, uh, not being so nomadic and, when we started settling, we started having um, dumps. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was uh, the wolves that were like the least um, fearful that uh, would sort of benefit calorically from eating our wasted food mm. uh, from the dumps. And of course it would benefit us too to have, you know, um, animals that <laughs> to get rid of some of that waste for sure, us. Sure, sure. And um, that, you know, over probably, you know, a, not that many, a couple dozen generations, this natural selection happened of, um, you know, the wolves getting basically friendlier and less and less fearful, um, simply based on the fact that, um, you know, the ones who were least fearful were the ones who would benefit most from the food and not have to, you know, be like hunting and scavenging and whatever. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I think up until 150 years ago, there was no such thing as commercial dog food. Dogs did just eat what, what we were getting rid of, but I guess it's, we, we've, we've now come to a new point in that with what you're doing in a really like interesting way. My dog eat, licks my plate. <laughs> he does the rinse cycle yeah my dog does too do. my dogs love veggie scraps so when we're cooking oh, yeah. meals and chopping vegetables we give them the little like ends of like the zucchini or little tops of the bell peppers because they absolutely love them they they basically can't distinguish them from from any other treats so wow I, I, love, I love that i love giving like throwing a handful of bell peppers and watching them have, have a really good time. <laughs> now I have to ask, have you tried any of your treats? I did. I did try our treats. <laughs> it's, uh, Are any of them particularly delicious? I would say the blueberry and mint is probably the most <laughs> like familiar uh, to us. <laughs> it tastes like a cookie that's not very sweet. So um, we don't add any sugar to them. So it's, it's very like a mild uh, mild cookie. <laughs> picking your ingredients, um, were you, I mean, what is it like picking ingredients for a dog? Were, were you trying to like, sorry, blah, blah. were you trying to like create limited ingredient treats? You said you wanted to make not include, or they don't include, um, you said wheat, right? Yeah, they're free of wheat, soy, and corn, and corn. Yeah, and artificial ingredients like any other flavorings really it's just if, if it's blueberry and it's mint it's coming from blueberry and it's actual mint leaf you know rather than any artificial flavoring is there is there one like key ingredient to getting like the kind of nice texture that you're describing in your treats where you can break them up uh, yeah i mean without getting them to crumble we we use sunflower as a base in our treats um it provides a lot of uh it's actually nutritionally, it's uh, good fiber, good um, healthy fats, though it's been pressed. So the oil, a lot of it's lower fat than like any sunflower that you would eat at home. Um, so yeah, it helps, it really helps create this nice texture in our products that I think is pretty unique. And people have been really, people and dogs have been really enjoying. And sunflower, are there benefits to sunflower for the dog? Um, it's just, higher in protein, lower in fat, um, in this particular circumstance, since it's been pressed, um, it has a good amount of fiber. So the fiber helps 
keep dogs regular and um, <laughs> keeps things together. Um, and so it acts as a digestive aid in that way as well. Well, um, I've learned a lot. Thanks a lot for taking the time to talk. If you're in New York, if we can ever travel again, you'll have to <laughs> school for the dogs to say hello. And I'm, I'm excited to see, are you guys creating new products as well? Yeah, we're working on, um, we just, we actually did just launch a bunch of products. We did dental sticks and we did, I know those. yeah, we also launched a, uh, a jerky line. So I'll be working on more jerky flavors to come out later this year. And then also uh, potentially some other um, flavors of our, our biscuits or even um, other types of categories next year as well. You can learn more about Shameless Pets at shamelesspets.com and you can purchase Shameless Treats at storeforthedogs.com or at our East Village location at 92 East 7th Street in Manhattan. Thanks so much for listening. You can support School for the Dogs podcast by subscribing, leaving a five-star review, telling your friends, and shopping in our online store. Learn more about School for the Dogs and sign up for lots of free training resources on our website, schoolforthedogs.com.